To me, People Advisory is simply giving your client ideas around all things employees. People Advisory to me is making sure that people are seen and heard and they are felt. Helping our clients manage their employees and manage their business in a way that's going to help them both grow. Help their employees grow and help them grow as a business. If uh, an advisor goes in and kind of helps someone start thinking about that in a holistic way, it can be a, a really more, again, more intentional strategy for how employers want to define who they are. Like, what is our culture? What matters to us? What do we What do we want to be known for? They want to have freedom. They want to just build a place that, in our case, we wanted to build the kind of company that we would want to work at. Now that I've started looking at People Advisory in a new and different way, it's helped me grow my practice. When you start getting involved in um, that type of work, the relationship with the client goes so much deeper. Just to dive into certain details that we wouldn't otherwise dive into. And so they're going to keep coming back and asking more questions. And I think what that naturally leads to is the more confidence we have as firm owners and in the firm, and the more skills we bring up, we're just going to naturally find more service offerings to deliver, right? We're not going to be, a, we're not still out there doing debits and credits the old way we were doing before as accounts. We've moved into lots of other practices. The impact that I make with my clients is making them feel like they have someone to talk to when it comes to helping them manage and grow their business. The thing you're offering to them is peace of mind that, that their people are being taken care of, that it's being done properly, and that it's something that they might be able to take back off of their plate and have it done professionally. We want to see them succeed. I mean, that, that, that's why I'm in this. You know, I want to see them succeed because if they succeed, I succeed. Well, hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. I'm Will Lopez, along with Caleb Newquist, who has an impish grin and loves his gin. We're live working from home at Gusto, and you are on the margins. You like that little rhyme session I had I right do, there? I always, I love a, I love a good rhyme. And in <laughs> fact, you know, it was the, uh, my wife and I went on a date the other day. And uh, I had a gimlet, which the key, oh. ingredient, the key ingredient is gin and lime juice, of course. Look at that. I know, I know, I know Will is a fan of limes. Yeah. Um, and it was very refreshing. It's got to be, <laughs> it's got, I think I'll be drinking them all summer. If, 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 I'm, if I'm going in the liquor direction, gimlets are going to be the order. 
That's nice. What I'm yeah. Well, well, speaking of the so weekend, gin, yes, gin, I'm into it. Oh yeah, love it. And with an impish grin, you got to do that of as well. Yes, of course. How was the weekend? We had two holidays over the weekend. We had Juneteenth on Saturday, yes, yeah. and then we have Father's Day. What yeah. you do? And the first day of summer. Oh, that's uh, right. Um, yeah, I mean, there was a lot going on. Uh, I didn't do much, to be honest. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, just uh, it's been hot in Denver. It's been mm-hmm. wicked hot. And um, so, you know, you, you get out in the yard and like, you know, if you're of Scandinavian descent, that means you wear a big, you wear a hat that shades your entire body. Yep. And, um, Under the umbrella hats. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I actually wear one of those uh, lifeguard hats that you see, uh, you know, in Hawaii or, you know, these places where people live at the beach. Right. And uh, it, it casts a nice shadow. So well, I could, that, I could, I could definitely see that, especially with some like suntan lotion, just un, unrubbed in around the nose. Yeah. You know, the zinc oxide, you know, that stuff that, that just lives like right on your face. And so you look <laughs> like, you know, some kind of, I don't know, it's a, like a bad mime, you know, yeah. it's a, it's a very her, her, a horrendous mime look. Yeah. yeah. So stuff in the yard, but then yeah, Father's Day was great. And um, uh, yeah, we had people in our house and it was, uh, it was, it was chaotic, uh, but I kind of like the, the chaos. So um, yeah. What about you? Uh, weekend was really straightforward. Um, family was like, hey, what would you like to eat for your for Father's Day? And I mm-hmm. went totally conventional pizza. And oh. I said, let's do a homemade pizza. So that's what we did. Nice. We did a little uh, eating out uh, on, on Sunday as well, as well as a homemade pizza. So I just went for it. You know, you got to go nice. all the way. Do you have but... a go-to, what's a go-to pizza topping for oh, you? Oh, totally. Hawaiian all the way. Oh, so... no kidding wow pineapple, that's apple con- barbecue sauce uh you know bacon the whole thing Ham. i mean i'm a fan but that is that is a bit controversial like there are people <laughs> that have very like strong feelings about pineapple on pizza and yeah. i think they're wrong frankly so i'm yeah. i'm with you on this yeah i was gonna say but, those feelings are definitely misplaced yeah so. they're wrong they, those feelings are wrong <laughs> is what we're saying well hey if you're watching us thank you so much if you dropped in on linkedin youtube facebook l- thank you so much for joining us Uh, Follow us on LinkedIn, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and join our group on Facebook. We'd love to have you. Caleb, we have a super jam-packed show. We have Twyla joining us, head of uh, FreshBooks Accountant Program, which is really exciting. And we have a really nice topic today. Some would say even controversial. Mm, Kind of like pineapple and pizza. Well, yes. It's the pineapple pineapple on pizza topic of Of the accounting profession. Of the accounting world. Yes. yes. Yeah. I love it. Um, so how about we just dive into it? Here's our next segment, staying balanced. Oh, I am excited for this segment, Kayla, because a little while ago, you wrote a really incredible piece through Gusto's blog on diversity and inclusion. Go on. And incredible, you say? It was incredible. It was extremely thoughtful and well thought out. And some people loved it and some people did not. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, uh, that is a, that is a, that is a, that is a, is that a fair assessment. That's a fair assessment. That's totally fair. Yeah. So I wrote this uh, newsletter and the, the, the email subject line or the, you can, you can visit it on Gusto's website if you like, and we'll drop that in the, in the comments of, of the, wherever you're watching this, but yeah, accounting uh, still on the diversity struggle bus. And um, this is, um, you know, since my going concern days, we've covered diversity and accounting's kind of failure at it. And, you know, there's, there's no shortage of like reports and surveys and studies that have been done about this. And it's 2021. And uh, the most recent, uh, the, the response that I wrote, or I was, I was writing in response to uh, this time a survey from uh, Cal CPA, the, Cal, the California Society of CPAs, and the IMA, the Institute, uh, Institute of Management Accountants. In this particular survey, they surveyed 3,000 uh, current, uh, cur- current and former accounting professionals, and uh, half then, nearly half of all of these professionals uh, about 48% consider the profession to be equitable, which is another way of saying more than half think it's not equitable. Okay. <laughs> so that's kind of like the, like the broad thing, the, the kind of the broad headline is that it's, it's, it's 50, 50. But then the other thing that I think that I found most um, surprising, and I guess uh, worrying and concerning for account for the accounting world is that uh, 43 to 55% of female non-white 
and LGBTQIA respondents polled have left a U.S. accounting firm due to a perceived lack of equitable treatment, with at least 30% of them leaving due to a perceived lack of inclusion. So mm. what was what I what the point I was trying to make in this newsletter, and I think I made it. Some people were reading something else, but I, I guess what is worrisome if you're if you care about the accounting world, and I know you do, Will Lopez. I do. Like this suggest what this survey suggests, what the findings suggest is that the accounting profession is <laughs> repelling people, like sending basically sending people away, and it is because there is a perceived lack of equitable treatment or a perceived lack of an inclusion, and that, if you care about the accounting world that should concern you. That's all I was trying to say. And some people did not take it that way. They took it a much different way. But I guess what I would say to you, Will Lopez, my, lo my, my question to you is, does that concern you as someone who cares about the accounting world? Well, you know, I think this is a really interesting topic because it, it, it does concern me because our profession is, is a long held profession. I think you and I talk about this. This is why even people advisories are around, right? Yep. Where it's like, you know, this is a tried and true industry. This is a tried and true career. This is a tried and true profession, and we should make it accessible and available to all. And, and we should not be discouraging others to not join it. And so, and, and to top that all off, the, the, the industry is on a brink of positive change. There's a talent gap shortage. Um, I mean, there's just so much uh, practical uh, just not, you know, no nonsense things that we should be really mindful about, uh, about. And when we think about like the diversity and inclusion concepts and, and just the, the passion for that, we should be making accounting accessible to everyone. So it's, it's really interesting. I, I, I was going to pull up and I was trying to find this while you were talking, but the, the practice of now, so Sage does a really good job on a, on a piece called the practice of now we don't have a visual for it, but it basically says that in order to stay ahead of clients' needs, the accounting profession needs to make the expertise of accounting accessible to more people, right? And, and, and because, you know, there is, uh, and we're hiring from non-accounting uh, backgrounds, which is a more and more prevalent position for firms to be in, I think the stat was like 82% of accounting firms globally are literally hiring from a non-accounting background, mm -hmm. right? And that just opens up the talent pool. It opens up uh, the, the window and the doors for, for diversity and inclusion to get talent that doesn't think like the norm, right? That doesn't think like, uh, or just, you know, has different perspectives. And, and that's so important with, uh, with a firm's team uh, and everything in between. So I, uh, I'd love for you to speak to this because there was a stat you fetched from, uh, the, uh, from accounting today on the reasons professionals left a company due to the diversity related issues. You, you were slacking me this, uh, this accounting today article. Yeah. And that's, that's the one, um, the, the accounting today article is the one that I was citing. Um, the, the, they, they wrote a pretty good piece on the, uh, on the study. And they also had some nice visuals, which are up on, on the screen now, but like, I think, um, I can't read that. That's so small, but I can <laughs> That is, I think put, what put on the extra pair of glasses here. Yeah, I know. It, um, <laughs> but I think it's it's just striking that the experience that people are having is is it, that this is what people are still experiencing in the accounting profession. Right. And something that is um, uh, some footnotes. I I, don't, I think it was this graph that you see here. But like the the footnotes to this graph in the accounting today article said. The data says the profession is underperforming in firms of diversity, equity, and inclusion for six reasons. Number one, diverse talent does not receive equitable access to the factors that contribute to career advancement. Two, bias persists throughout many stages of the employment process. Three, diverse talent is leaving employers and the profession at a faster rate than non-Hispanic white male uh, and non-LGBTQIA colleagues. Uh, four, a portion of the profession does not believe that any action toward DE and I improvement is needed. Five, DEI is not being treated as an issue that requires urgent attention. And six, a lack of accountability for DEI progress. All of that stuff is, which to say is, accounting is struggling. You can't deny it. Like the profession is struggling to, I don't think initially attract, if you look at like the AICP, AICPA trends report, attracting them is not the problem, right? Like 
half of all uh, enrollees in um, accounting programs are women. Um, mm-hmm. Half of the people, I believe, uh, yeah, in, uh, about 49%, I've got, I've, I, I actually looked up the trends report last night, 49% of the bachelor's and master's enrollees are, uh, enrollees are women, and that 50-50 split goes back to at least 2006, so it's been, this is the trend for about 15 years. 51% of bachelor's and master's graduates are women. Again, that trend goes back to at least 2006. Uh, that was the, mo- the, the, the earliest data they had in the report. And 51% of the graduates hired by CPA firms are women. So the attraction is not, it doesn't appear that the attraction bit is the problem. I think the profession has figured out a way to attract attract more women for or, and obviously we're talking about women today with twyla but like i think what is then concerning is if you look at the demographics in the very same AC, aicpa trends report the demographics in u.s accounting firms 47 percent of all professional staff are women okay 42 percent of the cpas in firms are women and 23 percent of partners are women so you see something happening with the experience with women, but also, also the other, you know, the, 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 the non-white and LGBTQIA, you are seeing something occur in firms that is sending them outside the profession. And I think it is a, it is, it is to the, it is the, it's at, it's the profession's loss that we do not have a more diverse, uh, equitable and inclusive profession. It is, it is the, it is the profession itself that will suffer over time. And I think having Twyla on to talk about these things is going to be very, very interesting. And um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's something that everyone should be concerned about. And I am, I am, am surprised that people would, well, I'm not surprised, frankly, I'm not surprised that people kind of misinterpreted what I was writing and kind of, you know, <laughs> kind of had to get ugly about it. But, yeah. uh, you know, it, really the bottom line is like, for this profession to be successful long-term, it needs to be an inclusive profession and it needs to be a more equitable and diverse profession. And if it isn't, then it will continue to, you know, it will, the, the questions about relevance that people keep asking and like those, those kinds of questions about the CPA profession, I think will continue to persist unless they, unless it becomes a more uh, inviting, inclusive and equitable place. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And uh, if, if you're watching on on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Go ahead and comment. I'm watching right now. But to your point, Caleb, I think, you know, the so what has been the theme of the profession for about 20 years, a talent shortage, right? And so there's a talent shortage. There's also what's happening right now is the great reassessment, right? The, the, the way work is being done, the way work is being experienced is drastically going through the great reassessment. That's, that's what 2021 is all about. And firms are, are kind of hemming and hawing about the talent needed to meet client demands, the talent needed to, to meet the moment and offer new services. And yet if you need people and you're not inviting people in, I just don't know how those two things line up. Right. And so I, I think to your point, it is, it is a, a long-term impact on the profession is detrimental to the profession. And even things like, um, you know, new service concepts, new offerings, new perspectives can come about uh, through a, a, a big tent pole accounting party, if mm-hmm. I were to say that, right, a, a big tent pole uh, party. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's really exciting, because I think that the profession has drastically changed so much that, you know, I remember the days of going back to FAU, my, my alma mater in South Florida, Florida Atlantic University, and running a cloud-based accounting firm and, and just getting all sorts of resumes. I think our res- the resumes that we got were like three times higher than the big four. And it was just because, hey, we want to experience something differently. We want something different. So I think it's just a great opportunity to just, you know, do, do what's right. And, uh, and then obviously meet the moment when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, bringing more te- more people onto your team. Right. And then just reap, reap the business rewards of that. Like, I mean, right. it's, it, you know, it, it isn't a secret that more diverse organizations perform better. No, it, yeah, that's absolutely like, right. I mean, study after study after study shows that. And so it's, it's, a, it's a mystery to me why this continues to be a problem in accounting. But we should get Twyla in here to talk about this, shouldn't we? Yeah, we should. Okay. Hey, uh, but before we move on to having Twyla on the show, 
we actually have a special announcement this week. If you are watching, hey, look, Gusto will be attending the AICPA's Engage at the Aria Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. Woo, Vegas, Caleb, from July 25th through July 29th. That's right. If you're attending, we'd love to see you. Both Caleb and myself will be in the Expo Hall. Uh, you'll get to meet us in person. There's our faces. We're at booth 309. And you know what else is exciting, Caleb? I'm going to wait for what you else is exciting, Will? What there we go. If, if you are attending Engage and you're arriving early for the conference and that's you, you can now sign up for our first in-person people advisory live certification training held in the ARIA. That's right. That's really exciting. The day before the conference, Sunday, July 25th, starting from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., Gusto will be offering a live certification course uh, right before Engage, and you can spend a day really growing your accounting skills and become a certified people advisor with a badge, certificate, six PE credits in person. Maybe you'll get some bonus swag as a result of it. So you can save your spot and, and get up to $100 off right now, plus access to Gusto's conference kickoff party that evening. Uh, so join us in Las Vegas. You can sign up at gsto.co forward slash live cert aria. That's gsto.co forward slash uh, live cert aria. That's right. Gusto is making it so at Engage. Hey, Caleb, let's introduce Twyla. Twyla, thank you so much for coming on the show. Let's see here. We can get her in the room. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Hold on. I had a little script for you and I totally botched it. She's so sharp with her thoughts. She comes with a warning label. Uh, Twyla is the head of accountants at FreshBooks, has a recurring show on Clubhouse on women in accounting, recently launched womeninaccounting.com. Visit it, by the way. Needless to, say, needless to say, she's changing the world for the better. Twyla, we're, we're really honored to have you on the margins. Thanks so much, Will, and thanks for having me here, Caleb and Will. And I will start out by saying, I is there any other pizza ingredient than pineapple? Like, it's not a real pizza. There isn't pineapple in that pizza. Wow. And so, I'm yeah, many many people don't I'm know that. that. That's why that's why you're on the show is because you <laughs> you just agreed that pineapple should be an ingredient on the pizza. So that was part of the vetting process. If you want that's to right. be on this show, you have to agree to pineapple being a key ingredient of all pizzas. So I'd love to hear from you, like, how did you land at FreshBooks? And then, and then we'd love to turn the conversation into your thoughts and perspectives about diversity and inclusion, women in accounting, people of color in accounting, um, and all of the above. But I, I know prior to, to FreshBooks, you had your own accounting practice. Uh, you were at Helm as well, which is like a financial forecasting or business intelligence app. But yeah, tell, tell us, you know, how'd you get to where you're at right now? Well, you, you gave the short version right there in terms of my part of my career progression, or at least the last, call it 10 years of my career. I am a CPA. I'm definitely not a, a traditional CPA. I'm very much what I'd call a modern or a new age or whatever we want to tech focus type CPA. And I did have an accounting and advisory practice with a business partner of mine. And then out of that advisory practice, we started a cash flow forecasting tool called Helm. And that came as solving a pain point for our own clients as we were delivering advisory. And then I was in touch with FreshBooks. To be honest, we were talking about, does it make sense to integrate Helm? And, and we were having conversations that way. And that's when I learned that they were starting a new accountant channel and creating a, wanting to create a brand new uh, accounting partner program. And it caught my attention because over those few years when I was inside of the firm and then uh, working it with Helm and, and the industry, as we did a lot of beta testing and a lot of working with other accounting professionals, I really start to be, started to be connected with other industry professionals. And I got really inspired by the work that we had done and how that could be helpful to others in the industry. We were really fortunate that we started doing advisory before it was called advisory. My very first accounting job was inside of an advisory type firm back in 1999. So this is very natural, a very natural transition for me to do advisory and understand advisory. And as I started to work with more and more accounting professionals, I realized 
it's something that we're trying to learn as a profession at large and change up the services and, and uh, really kind of do accounting a different way, as you said earlier, Will. And I was able to then give some of that back. So when I spoke with FreshBooks and learned about what they're up to, I realized that was an opportunity for me to extend the reach further. Part of my passion is around using technology inside of your firm to create that human advisory experience. And working with FreshBooks and being part of FreshBooks, a global technology platform, was that opportunity to create something different, create something that's unique, but yet still um, contributes to this evolution that we have right now inside of our industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, with that passion, you know, you, you've, you've launched a, a few things uh, that a lot of women in accounting have been able to participate in, which is the, the clubhouse um, discussions that you've had, and even the website, I mean, uh, or the program with the website. I, actually, I, 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 when you announced it, I found out a little bit more about it, uh, but what do you try to tackle on clubhouse specifically? Yeah, so the clubhouse really was honestly a, a Friday night kind of a, what is this clubhouse? I'm going to check it out. And I kicked off some conversations and it just really evolved organically based off of myself as a woman in accounting, speaking to other women in accounting and what I saw clubhouse providing in terms of a platform to showcase other women in our industry. When I started on a journey back a few years ago and, and did something called the video per day experiment, which I know will at one point you participated in and yep, we, had the, we had a big group of people that would were participating in, in the video per day experiment that came from a panel conversation I was on, on international women's day, where we were talking about women having a seat at the table and how we need to speak up and give women the mic. And when I ended that conversation, I was like, okay, I can't just have an hour long conversation, not do anything. What am I going to do from here? And it started with me doing that video per day experiment and getting more comfortable and confident my, myself in front of the mic or in front of the camera. And then it evolved to being a community of others who wanted to do the same. So when it came to Clubhouse, I realized this was such a, a thoughtful process to that was easy, to be honest, it was easy to create a stage inside of Clubhouse that was around because there's no cameras on Clubhouse, <laughs> right. but still gave women an opportunity to be spotlighted, to be showcased, and to perhaps take the mic for the very first time. And so that's what the Women in Accounting Speaker Series is, is all about, is identifying a woman in our industry who you may or may not know, and maybe you know them, but you just don't know their personal human story. And it's, it's bringing them to the mic and letting them share inside of that hour, letting other women ask that woman questions because there's so much we can get from one another and, and understanding one another's journeys. And Clubhouse was just such an easy organic platform to do that on. So Twyla, I, I wanna ask, what do you think, I, I rattled off all kinds of statistics in the prior segment, but I'm just <laughs> curious, just your personal experience, based on your personal experience and your, uh, and, and your experience talking to other women about this, like what seems to be the main obstacle in your mind that is holding back progress in this area? And by prog in, in this area, I mean, just like the, the, just the, the, the opportunities and the, and the equitable and inclusive, uh, the inclusivity of, of women, especially at the highest levels of firms. Yeah, it, I, I have lots of opinions on that. And, and, you know, you said how diversified it is from a gender perspective at the early onset of somebody's career. And then when it comes to partner, the number is no longer uh, equitable or no longer the same or no longer split nearly down the middle. And I think there's a few pro uh, uh, things contributing to that problem that exists. One of them is the fact that even though there's a big evolution in our, in our industry, there's still a grind when it comes to making partner and getting to that spot of being a leader. And women have more than one commitment in a lot of cases, as in they're trying to raise a family, or even more so, depending on their age and where they're at in, in their life, they might even be what's called a sandwich caregiver, meaning that they're looking after their their parents and their children at the same time. And then trying to navigate their career and, and work towards leadership, there's a lot of hours that still tend to go into getting to that spot. And it's hours that women can't 
our early ones to have that balance and be able to work towards that. And so I think that that's one of them. I think that there's also still a lack of opportunity to really um, give some of these women the, the mic and the stage and the leadership roles. And I think that as women, even I've recognized that we are guilty of some of that, that problem or that challenge because we haven't seen other women as leaders that we are working, to, like that, that we can kind of model after. And we almost are fighting for the same jobs because we think, okay, I have the 10 people at the table, two or three of them are women. And we're all trying to fight for those same roles. And now we're starting to come together and collaborate more inside of what, if, if you kind of look at, at some of the models, it's like the shine theory, where it's like, I don't shine if you don't shine, which means we're in this together. And I think that that's changing. Women used to be quite competitive with one another. And now as you kind of peel back the layers, you realize that's because we were fighting for a couple of spots at the table. and. And that, that that's now transforming. So I think that that's another one. And then I also think that because of that lack of leadership that's at the top being female, we don't always have that same mentorship to help us get there and support us to get there. And, and women sometimes historically have been the ones who can lack confidence. And if they don't have somebody as their cheerleader and their mentor and their, their supporter who understands the challenges of of being a woman or being a caregiver along with their, their, their career, then we aren't fully supported in things like burnout or things like um, imposter syndrome, things that sneak in that may not sneak in as, as often or as frequently for our male counterparts. Now, it, it, you know, with that passion top of mind for yourself, is that, is that what prompted you to, to start womeninaccounting.com? I mean, is it, is, is womeninaccounting.com your way of trying to solve the problem at large? Uh, it's actually womeninaccounting.online. Oh, so I'm sorry. checking it out. That's okay. Um, womeninaccounting.online is, is the website. And that w it's not a solve. Uh, that I do believe that, that in order to make progress, it always has to be a multi-pronged approach. This is one piece of that approach or one pillar inside of that approach. What happened all through 2020 was that we saw so many accounting professionals going through a lot last year. It was heavy, just even personally helping our clients, ongoing changes and gosh, you, you folks on PPP and all the things, right? It was such a, such a tiring year. And a year ago or just over a year ago, I left my practice. So I wasn't in a spot where I was helping accounting or business owners anymore. And so what that meant was that I was kind of feeling like I was sitting on my hands a bit, as in what do I do to support accounting professionals? As we got to the end of the year, we started to see data around women were struggling the most with 2020 for all the reasons I've already shared. They wear many hats and they've got multiple roles and they're trying to hold that, be the glue that holds it all together. And so, and myself, I became one of those sandwich caregivers. So I too was on this spot of like, gosh, this is heavy. It's a lot. I feel tired. And I, I thought about how could we support one another? What do I need? And then as I reached out to my network, I quickly realized that, gosh, we have this opportunity to wrap our arms around one another more, support one another more than ever, do it in this virtual environment that we've all become so accustomed to over the past 12 months. And create a mentorship program and platform that can facilitate and foster mentorship relationships coming together, as well as create a safe community for women in our industry from all different top types of roles, all different levels and experiences to come together and support one another and collaborate and have some really, really thoughtful discussions in a safe that feels, feels really safe. Hmm. Do you have, um, do you, do you, look to any other are there industry i guess what i'm trying to ask is are there industries in your mind that are that have had some success in air in 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 this area and are there things that the accounting world can learn from those do you have any examples of those funny enough as i kicked off right in the early stages of kicking off this idea i had people reach out saying, could you create this for women in law? Could you create this for women in engineering? Could you do a branch of it for women in technology? I think that we're all trying to move the needle and make gender and, and, 
and um, other other things like diversity come to the forefront and, and really change and evolve, along with some of the other evolution that we've had in our industry. Well, you, you mentioned that we've had so much change inside of this industry, but there's pieces of it that have have kind of been left behind. And I think that other industries experience that too. I can't say that there's one industry that I look at and say, that's, that one's got the gold seal. They've already reached it, they're already there. I think it's always an ongoing process. And I think that there's always just new challenges that come into each individual industry. I mean, perhaps you could say something like the creative industries are, are better at this than we are versus we're such a traditional industry at heart that maybe they're further along, maybe uh, they're um, a little bit newer even in their industry life cycle than we are or their origin than we are. But there isn't one that I say that I can say that I model anything after when it comes to gender diversity. Yeah, and I think in the same vein, um, you know, I know there's, you know, uh, diversity and inclusion is such an important topic and it's and it's spoken about a lot. Um, but practically speaking, how, how does it, in your opinion, how does an accounting firm take its first step towards something like that? Uh, its first step to being more thoughtful about the team that it brings on, the individuals that they empower, um, or even the communities in which their clients uh, represent as they serve them. Well, interestingly enough, I'm learning a lot from being part of the diversity, inclusion, and belonging a team here inside of FreshBooks, which has been really eye-opening. And there's been lots of bits of information. And I'm like, this really applies to the accounting industry and the struggles that we're having there too. And to be honest, I think always it starts internally. We had this conversation yesterday about how do we attract talent and bring in those fresh new ideas and those fresh new faces and, and mix things up and make sure that we are really diverse. But the trouble is, is that you will bring them in and then it churns kind of like you were saying before there, Caleb. And, and if we don't have, it's like doing your housekeeping or having your foundation in order and, and making sure that your people that you've already got inside of your organization are feeling like they understand diversity and that they feel that there is a sense of belonging, they are included. Have we done all of that work first? Because if you go out and say, okay, I need to hire more women, I need to hire more people of color, but you haven't done the internal housework, you'll always be chasing. And, and there's so much internally to be done just around things like language and things that are just in our blind spots that bubble up all the time. We had a conversation last week about how somebody was saying, using the word bossy, and how that's not taken lightly by a woman when you call her bossy. And the, the, the man who said it considered it a compliment that she was good at taking control and leading a team. But just that language alone can really make people feel uncomfortable. And if you don't have that at least progressing forward and that you've got a commitment to making that change and, and that evolution in terms of diversity in, in your organization, you might be able to attract some new talent with some new recruiting ideas and some, some real keen eyes on, on making sure that you, you bring in some of those fresh new minds or, or people of color or more women or what have you, but it'll, it'll just be in and out. You'll, you, you won't ever feel like you're making progress and the people inside of your organization will feel that way too. So can you talk a little bit about, and I know we're, we're doing okay on time, right? Yeah, we're doing great. Okay, cool. Um, can you talk a little bit about intersectionality and like the importance of that? And uh, and so what I mean by that is like the intersection of you know uh, uh, women in accounting, but also maybe it's the LBGQ community or maybe it's communities of color. Can you just talk about the role of intersectionality and its importance? You know, I think that this when you talked about Caleb receiving some comments earlier about, about your previous article, one could probably throw some comments at me saying, she's a white girl, what does she know about these things? I, I you know, my sexual orientation is that of very traditional. And like, I don't necessarily have all of the experience and the understanding of the challenges and the struggles and the bias and the racism that other folks face. But what I do know is what it's like to be a woman in accounting. And at least I can start there and then grow my knowledge and start to, in some cases, even apply what I've learned from really going in deep with understanding 
gender diversity and how a lot of that actually applies to some of these other like race and, and sexual orientation and religion and, and obviously runs deeper in, and can be much, in a much more hurtful way. But there's so much that you can learn from at least starting with yourself and anything that you felt before. Even something as simple as my husband was telling me, he's six foot two and he never thinks about where he's going to go for a run, never. Mm. Versus I think about it all the time. What time is it? I can't go at six in the morning. That's not safe as a woman, even though it's daylight. And so even just starting to think about that and then you take that further to think about people of color who don't feel safe going for a walk in certain neighborhoods at any time. And so there's there's so much that we can learn from one another that it's not just about this pillar, this pillar, this pillar, or this, this kind of group of people, this group of people. There's a lot of commonality. It's that theory of we're more alike than we are different. And we just need to peel back the layers to get to that spot and then see how it applies to all of these different groups of people and then how we can come together to make it better. Well, I have a question for you. I, I know you and I have uh, talked about this quite a bit because not only is there a... Um, there is a inclusion, diversity and inclusion struggle bus going on within the profession. Uh, even things like people advisory, which was actually built out of the out of like a an inclusive mindset that say, hey, you know, as accounting professionals, we're just giving advice to the owners and we're not thinking about the team members when we're doing that. How does how does you know diversity and inclusion collide with? better serving clients and the communities they represent, right? Because I think there's there's such a tight correlation there because uh, people are passionate about, you know, their heritage and their backgrounds and who they are. And a lot of that translates into uh, deeper passion for client services and, and uh, as a professional in accounting. Two things come to mind when you were saying that, Will, and, and one is that Advisory to me really is about utilizing technology to create some sort of human relationship, human value, and really using yourself inside of what you're delivering to your client, more so than pumping out a tax return, which I appreciate takes a lot of skill, but doesn't take the same level of human uh, relative to advisory. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, let's talk about whether or not people of color or people who are from LBGTQ communities, do they, women, do they feel confident to be an advisor? And that's one of the, the things that I work with a lot with women is that they lack confidence to even have these conversations with their client that are, in, are the human piece of advisory, that are adding the value, that do create deeper relationships. So I think that that's one piece first, because if we don't if they don't have the confidence to deliver the services, then we've got a, a, a early roadblock. Then second is that the when they talk about a human experience, people want to work with people who are relatable. And so there's such an opportunity for all of these different uh, groups of people to then work with their communities and their groups of people and extend these services to others who may have felt intimidated or may have felt like these services were not within their reach or with somebody that was personable that they related to that they felt they could have that human connection with. And so I think that that's really exciting to me that more and more business owners that are trying to run businesses and run teams and, and do all these things will then have advisors who feel like them, that they can confide in, that they can trust, that they are relatable to, and that that's super powerful. Those relationships will be so valuable to the business owners and, of course, extremely fulfilling for those advisors. Yeah, that's incredible. Kayla, I think we have time for probably one more question um, before we, we try to transition over oh. to you. I've got it. You got it? Let's yeah, do I've it. got it. So, okay. So Twyla, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, things are not trending in a good direction. So my, my, my question for you is, can, can accounting turn it around? And if so, mm. uh, how? I believe everything can be turned around. So 
That's a, that's an easy answer for me. Yes. And, and I, if, if I say no, what does that mean for Will and I right now? <laughs> no, <laughs> we're doomed. We're, we should just all quit. <laughs> uh, but I do believe it can be turned around. But what I think it takes is more conversations about pineapple and pizza. Like, let's just have those conversations, write more content, Caleb, get that, get, get those conversations out there. You see it on tax Twitter all the time that there's can be some real flare ups on Twitter. And it's around these conversations that need to be had. And the only way to see that change and that we aren't doomed is to keep having these conversations and then learn from it, grow from it, bring that part of our industry to the same evolution we've had with technology, to the same evolution we've had with advisory. There's so much evolution that's happened that we haven't brought this along with it. I think there's a few other things we haven't brought along with it, but this one in particular, the one that we're talking about today, we can make a conscious effort to bring it up. I think it's just gonna take more and more conversations, more and more learning, more and more listening and hearing and understanding what we can all do to contribute to that change and, and make it better. Well, that's stellar on that note. I mean, I, I don't wanna like, uh, that's a, such a great high note to end. Twyla, how can, how can if you're watching, I, I didn't see any comments, but how could people follow you, uh, get more of Twyla and, and, and all her glory? Uh, do you have a, you know, are you on Twitter? Is there a way for them to sign up at Women in the County Got Online um, or, and the like, so? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I, I am on Twitter, LinkedIn. Those are my two favorites. I hang out a little bit on, on Instagram and Facebook, but find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. We have the women in accounting.online platform. And then of course I'm carving out the new accountant channel and with the building out the team now to create a really exciting accounting partner program at FreshBooks, which is freshbooks.com forward slash accountants. And that's that's really where I live. I, I spend and oh Clubhouse, of course. Uh, Clubhouse on Tuesdays. Every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern is that Women in Accounting speaker series. That is not for just women. That is also for men to join the audience and listen to another woman's story and be a cheerleader and support her and her journey and, and her, her kind of next step and maybe even getting brave and uncomfortable and, and sharing her story with us. Well, that's awesome. Well, Twyla, thanks for thanks for coming on, and uh, you're you're an inspiration and a role model. And I think uh, Caleb and I uh, just couldn't be more honored to have you on on the margin. So, well, thank um, you. Appreciate your time. Thanks so much, guys. All right. See thanks, ya. Twyla. Hey, uh, so much work ahead of us, right? Yeah, there's some work to be done. There's some, a little bit of work. A little bit of work. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, it's just really exciting, and and I think once again, very excited about this topic, even. Uh, and how this topic can really solve a lot of just the obvious things in accounting and, and just doing what's right and solving the obvious things in accounting. So uh, we're going to hear Twyla's perspective on all of it. Hey, take us home. Yeah, I'll do. I'll read some credits. This edition <laughs> of On the Margin uh, On the Margins Live was written and produced by Will Lopez and, and myself. Uh, our co-producers are Mohini Kundu and Andrea Garcia Vargas. Video and sound production by Waylon Janwick and Rylan Harris. Graphic design by Paul Choi. If you like this show, recommend it to a friend or a colleague. Get some pineapple on your pizza, people. It's not going to kill you for crying. Out. Like just, I mean, if you need just bacon and pineapple, what's wrong with that? Just give it a try. All right. Jeez, All right. We're, not, we're not asking for the, we're not asking for the moon here. <laughs> anyway, our next show will be in two weeks. That's what? That's like July 2nd? Yep. July 2nd. There we go. We got a show. Uh, until then, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be uh, grinning and ginning out on the margins.